We gather again this morning to praise and to worship and to adore our God. And it is so good to be with you. And I hope and pray that as you are tuning in this morning, that that you too are filled with a desire to praise and adore God, because that's exactly who he created each of us to be. What a privilege it is to worship him and to do so with you. And let's continue in this spirit of worship as we pray together. Won't you join me this morning? Oh, good heavenly Father, we are grateful to you for the blessings of life, for all that you have done for us, for all that you mean to us. Lord God, I thank you for each person that has tuned in to worship you today. And I thank you, God, that that you are in their homes and in their hearts. Father, I praise you that in the midst of the life challenges that we continue to experience in our world today, that you are just showing yourself supreme and almighty God, that there is nothing, no circumstance, no situation, no matter how difficult it may be or how challenging or how bleak it may seem, that they can stop your people from praising and adoring and worshiping you. And that's what we desire to do today, and that's what we come to do today, Lord God, is to acclaim your name and to thank you for being the beautiful and amazing God that you are. 
we give you ourselves in worship this day, Lord God, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. I trust that you and your family are continuing to deal with the issues that we are all facing with the virus and the different stages of being at home and getting back out again. Um, you might be one of those who are watching all the news reports, or maybe you're just done with all of that, and uh, you are just going on with life as best you can under the circumstances. But in the midst of it all, life does go on, doesn't it? And you know, outside of the context of what has been happening with the coronavirus, we still see that families are experiencing loss. There are still those who unfortunately are, are leaving us going to glory, um, but through other illnesses and through other means, there are still funerals that have to take place in the midst of these challenging days. There are people with health concerns and those health concerns have to be addressed. Um, they need to see their doctors, whether electronically or even in these days now, somewhat in person as well. And procedures have to be run and blood work has to be taken and hospitals have to be uh, open so that people can go and get the treatments that they need. Babies are still being born in our world today. How exciting that is in our family. One more month. Yes, yes, our first grandchild is on the way. We're so excited. Other matters of life need tending to. Things need to be taken care of in your home. Things with your automobile need to be repaired and maintained so that they are in good working order. Life happens, doesn't it? In our own family, uh, my wife made a new friend as she needed to take my daughter to the doctor. And as they were going, um, apparently this new friend decided she really liked the looks of, of our car and the intersection that my wife was in the middle of. And so she decided to just plow right into the side of her car. Um, everyone was fine. No one was hurt. Praise God. But there is one of those um, inconveniences and annoying things that has to be taken care of unplanned, but you got to get it done, right? Life still goes on. For some people, the financial issues and strain and stress is just mounting and was there before any of this ever began and has only escalated and become worse as a result of it. In the same vein, there are those who had job issues or concerns or frustrations, perhaps even looking for another place to work um, long before all of this started. And again, as, as the, the stay home, work from home issues have come to be, maybe those things have gotten even worse. There are those students who are concerned about, did they get everything that they needed from their classes before school shut down? There are parents who are concerned, are their students, are their children prepared and ready for what is to come next? Those difficulties are there and they're real. There are relationship strains and some families being together has put a strain on the relationship and others being apart and not being able to see each other has added its own frustrations as well. We all have some other difficulties that are taking place in our life. And no matter when we return to some sense of normalcy or back to some sort of routine that we once had, all these other things, they're not just going to magically disappear, are they? No. So our question today is, what do you do? What do you do? Where do you turn for real? Not looking for some nice church cliche that, yes, in the midst of frustration, God works in mysterious ways. No, where, where do you turn when you're just at the end of your rope? When you're down to that very last nerve and there's just no more. You just can't take it any longer. Your feelings and your emotions are raw. What's your gut reflex action when you're just done? When you're just done, when you've just had enough? Well, this morning, I want us to look at one of the Psalms, a few verses in one of the Psalms. The book of Psalms in our scriptures are so beautiful, so poetic. Um, they explore such a depth and a range 
of real and true and raw emotion and have been used in worship over centuries and centuries. Um, as we look at the Psalms, we see so many of them even have instructions in their headings about the kind of uh, worship that, that they were intended for. And the one that we look at this morning has just that, mentioning the stringed instruments in the heading. And also the verses that we look at conclude with the word selah. The scholars have debated for centuries what that word precisely means and aren't quite sure, but believe it does, in fact, have some sort of worship instructional context to the worship leaders. So the Psalms help us. They help us to explore uh, our own emotions as we see through other, the psalmists, the poets that have written these, what they were experiencing. The psalm that we look at this morning, it says, is a psalm of David. There are many scholars that debate that, but I believe that it is of David. And for, for sake of argument this morning, we will assume David has written this one. Some of the particulars of this specific psalm um, are unknown. We're not exactly sure where or what David was experiencing in the moments in which he wrote this. But we do know that he spent so much of his time on the run fearing for his life. His enemies were out to get him. When he rose up strong in the Lord, he had quite a lot of opposition. And we see that coming through in the words that he has penned. And so we hear his deep prayer in this psalm this morning. It is Psalm 61. And we're going to look at the first four verses together this morning. I invite you to turn there or just listen as I read Psalm 61 verses one through four. Hear my cry, O God. Listen to my prayer. From the end of the earth, I call to you when my heart is faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you are my refuge, a strong tower against the enemy. Let me abide in your tent forever. Find refuge under the shelter of your wings, Selah. We hear the anguish in David's words and in his heart. Hear my cry, O oh God, hear me, listen to my prayer. I'm at the ends of the earth crying out to you, calling out to you, my heart is so faint. But then we also, just a few verses later, we hear his confidence in God. You are my refuge. You are my strong tower against the enemy, David says. Let me abide in your tent forever. I seek the shelter of refuge in your wings. Isn't that what we all need? Isn't that what we all long for? That when we are in that place of just being overwhelmed and feeling despair, that we want and desire that refuge in God, that, that strength and confidence in him. That's what we really all need, isn't it? We see here that David has cried out. He says, hear my cry, listen to my prayer, understand me, God, give attention. He's pleading with God to hear him and to hear his heart. And he states that he is calling to him from the very ends of the earth. Uh, scholars have debated this phrase as well. For many, they believe that what he is referencing here is that he is away from the sanctuary, away from the place of worship, away from that place where God's presence resided. Others uh, think more in terms of the way I, I kind of read it, and perhaps you do as well, that he is just at the end of all things. He's at the end of himself, doesn't really know what else to do or where else to turn. He's calling from the ends of the earth. Some people say it's, it's a reference to the grave, that he is that close to death. He is in such despair. David also says here that his heart is faint, his heart deepest part of the inner man. It is just the very center of the human spirit, and it's overwhelmed with despair. His heart is faint and weak. But folks, doesn't it give you peace that God hears us no matter how far away we have fallen, no matter how difficult we believe our situation is, or, or what level of depth uh, of just 
fright and fear and, and overwhelmed feelings and emotions we're in, he hears us. And even when we can't speak, the scripture tells us in Romans 8, 26, that the Holy Spirit helps us. The Holy Spirit intercedes for us. The Holy Spirit sighs for us, sighs that are just too deep for words on our behalf to the Heavenly Father. He hears us all right, whether we're able to speak it ourselves, groan it ourselves, or whether we depend on the Holy Spirit. God hears us no matter where we are, no matter where we are coming from. And we see here too, David's plea, I would need refuge in you, God, I need shelter in you. You are my strong tower. Picture an ancient city with a big tall wall around it built there for defense and then rising above the, the wall itself, the very highest point in the city is the watchtower, the watchtower where there are, are people positioned there that are looking all around the city to ensure that the city stays safe from any intruders. That is the strongest place, the safest place in that height of the tower it is built to resist any sort of opposition. And David is calling upon God and, and stating that God is his strong tower in the midst of any enemy attack, anything that's going on in his life. He knows that God is his strong tower. And he goes on and continues in his prayer saying, just, just let me be in your tent forever. Just let me abide with you. Just let me have that shelter under your wings to forever, forever remain in your presence, God. Such a beautiful few verses, isn't it? To see that where David was in this, this very difficult, awful place, and where David's faith in God took him, to this refuge, to this shelter, to this shelter in God. And he said in that, that portion, they're straight in the middle. He says, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Lead me, God, to your presence. Lead me, Lord, to where I can be seeing life in your perspective. That's where David got to. God led him to a place. God took him to a place that is higher than he was, that was above and beyond, rising him above his circumstances and situations, taking him higher such that he could see life through the perspective of God to be in his shelter, to be in that strong tower with him. Take me higher, David cried out to God. Back in 1996, we lived in Atlanta. In 1996 in Atlanta, it was a big, big year. It was the year of the Summer Olympics there. Um, in order to be able to attend any of the events, there was a lottery and you had to get into the lottery in order to um, hopefully vie for some tickets to events. My family and I were very privileged uh, to be able to go to a couple of different events, not some of the big, popular events necessarily that, that really draw a lot of attention and are very, very expensive. Um, but we took in a couple of soccer games, a baseball game. And then at the time I was working um, in the corporate world and one of my customers uh, had a whole bank of tickets to field hockey games. And he gave me a couple of tickets to attend one of the late afternoon field hockey games. Um, I took my oldest daughter, Haley, she was six years old at the time. And the two of us hopped on the public transportation. That was an experience in itself, of course. And off we went to downtown Atlanta. We took in all of the sights and the sounds and the smells and the tastes, just a full blown experience of the Olympics in our hometown right then and there that afternoon. It was so much fun that we had. And then the time came for the field hockey game. And so we made our way over to the stadium. We took our seats and there we sat and we were watching the game. As you can imagine, the six-year-old was pretty bored at that point um, in uh, understanding what was going on. And to be quite honest, I wasn't quite sure myself what was happening. I was not uh, well-versed in, in the game itself or the rules. 
Um, but we were just enjoying ourselves and one another. We noticed that uh, this not being one of the more popular sports in the Olympics, uh, it wasn't completely sold out or anything. And so there were some seats in the stadium that were, were up higher. And so Haley and I made our way up to the very, very top of the stadium. And what we discovered when we got there was the most amazing thing. You could see across the city. You could see the cityscape of Atlanta. You could see the sun as it was setting there. You could see the Olympic flame that was burning in the big cauldron over the way. You could see other venues there. It was just a, a beautiful, beautiful sight. We had really enjoyed it. We're paying less attention to the game than we were just sightseeing from the very top of the stadium. Eventually, we sat down and started paying attention to the game. And as we did, there was a family sitting pretty close to us that were also there enjoying uh, the Olympics and enjoying this event. Something happened and they began to cheer. And the dad turned to me and said, do you know exactly what happened there? And I thought, well, is it that obvious? And from that point forward, he began to explain to me a little bit about the rules of the game and how it was played so that it made so much better sense to me as I was sitting up in the top of the stadium with this very friendly family. That was just a whole different perspective on the game and on the Olympics by being way up tall, higher in the stadium than where we were before. Stephen Furtick says that your perspective will either be your prison or your passport. That is, was so true for David, wasn't it? His perspective being in just the difficult, awful position that he was crying out to God from the ends of the earth. That could have been his prison, but instead he went to a higher place. He cried out to God, take me, lead me to the rock that is higher than I, such that his perspective then became his passport to freedom, to seeing life and understanding it through God's perspective. And that same promise is available to you and I that we too, we can be caught up in, in the, the muck and the mire of life, or we can pray to God, cry out to him, take me, take us to that rock that is higher than we are, such that we too, God, can experience life through your perspective. His grace, his mercy is so amazing, isn't it? God so often will leave us. I know he does me to my own devices when I am trying to do life on my own, do it my own way rather than turning to him as I should. And I get myself into some difficult fixes and he's just waiting. He's just waiting for me, for us to cry out to him. God is just waiting and longing to take us higher, to help us rise above, above our circumstances and to actually see beyond them. Going to that higher place with him, of course, doesn't eliminate those situations or circumstances at all, and it certainly doesn't eliminate the consequences of some poor judgment or bad decisions on our part. But, oh, it does take us higher, and it does allow us to see life differently, to see life through his lens, to see his purpose in life, to see that life is less distracted and less emotional and less fear-filled and less unsure and less unstable when we are with him, when we are in that rock-solid foundation of God himself. And I ask you this morning, and I ask myself as well, how much longer, how much longer are we going to stay where we are instead of crying out? For him to take us to that place that is higher than we are to be with him. Don't you want it? Don't you want that perspective that frees you, that is all about him and that is all with him? Him taking us higher, it's all ours just for the asking. I want us to spend a moment or two in thinking about what keeps you and I from that eternal perspective with God? What is it that for whatever reason prevents us from getting there? I think sometimes one of the things that, that does hold us back is, is our lack of belief, our lack of faith. 
God so much loves us, his children. Regardless of, of our past or even our present, the things that we are wrapped up in or have done that bring shame or guilt to us, he desires that we confess those to him. He desires that we repent from them in turn and go in a different direction and depend on him for the strength to do so. He desires that we have faith in him and him alone to get us to where he desires us to be. We are children of God and he loves us like no other. We have to grasp that truth and that promise of God. And as we do, then, oh yeah, he will lead us higher and we will be enthusiastically going with him to that higher place, that rock that is higher than we are. Sometimes I think too that our emotions kind of hold us, lock us into a place you know that feeling, right? You've been there where something happens in life and the emotions are heightened and there's lots of drama and you're kind of caught up in the mud and the muck and you're just plodding through the best that we can and people's emotions are just running rampant. It's hard to reason. It's hard to, to even sort it all out or figure it out or think through or even pray through sometimes as to how we're going to get out of this or work through this. We just need to diffuse those emotions. God longs to do that with us, to help us through that, to get us through those emotional difficulties so that he can take us to that place that is higher than we are, to take us higher to his perspective. Another challenge that we face as well is sometimes when we are caught up in this, this place in life where we feel that everything is coming against us, there's a strange and twisted sense of comfort that, can, that we can find there, isn't it? Sometimes it feels like we're a victim and, and we sort of rest there and, and hold tight there and have our pity parties and whine and complain and feel sorry for ourselves and just even sort of wallow in it a little bit. If we're not careful, that place of feeling that it will never be any better and I can never get anywhere, I'm stuck here forever and ever, it can be our defense mechanism for, for not doing what it is that God calls us to do, and that is just to cry out to him, to depend upon him, to long and yearn for him, to take us higher into his presence with him. Sometimes I think, the real issue just comes down to self. I just get in a fix and I just want to do life on my own. I've got it all figured out. I make decisions on my own. God gave me a brain and he expects me to use it and he teaches me and all that. And we just want to do things our way. And sometimes we just get off track a bit, don't we? We just miss out because we keep thinking, okay, well, this has happened and I made a decision. Well, now I've got a consequence that's in this direction. So I need to go over here and to fix and work on this particular circumstance in my life. And we find ourselves, if we're not careful, just running ragged and sometimes just kind of like the dog that chases its own tail. Sometimes we have to let self go and to cry out to him from the ends of the earth when our heart is weak and faint, when we just feel like we've tried everything and say, God, why didn't I turn to you sooner? Why didn't I cry out to you sooner? Take me higher, God, take me higher. Let me see your perspective. He desires that we abandon ourselves to him. And don't you want that? Don't you want that rock, him, that is so much higher than we are? I also ask myself today, what is God teaching you and me when we are in the very depths of difficulty and life challenge? What is it that he's trying to teach us there before he takes us to that higher place to see his perspective? What is God making of us in the midst of life difficulties? You know, God never, ever wastes a life experience. Not ever. 
whatever it is that we are going through, whatever it is that you and your family are going through in these days or before these days and beyond these days, whatever those experiences are, as hard or as difficult as they pray, as they are when you pray for him to take you higher, to take you to his eternal perspective. He's going to teach us. He's going to teach you and I. We will see that he wants us to help someone else that is walking on that very same road behind us. I know you've been there. I know you've experienced some of these things yourself. Life gets so tough and difficult. The storms come. The road is rocky. The mountains are high. The hurdles are high. God just wants us to understand as followers of Christ, surrendered to him, he so much desires in the midst of our challenge that we are able to see and know him, draw closer to him, to see life change and transformation in him, and then help others see the way, help show others the way, those who may not know him at all, or those who are young and growing in him, to help them see that God will take you higher. God desires your surrender, your all. God desires for you to abandon yourself into him and just to be his so that he can show you the way. God wants us to help those that need to find their way to him. He wants us to help shed that light for him. You know, it's more important now than it's ever been, I believe. Right now, it's so crucial And this is our time. This is our watch. We can't blow this. We've got to show folks and to help them that in the midst of whatever it is that they're experiencing in these days, that they too, like David, like we, can cry out to him from the the depths of despair and simply long for that refuge in him and be faithful knowing that he will take us higher to see his perspective. That's where it all begins, is when we recognize how desperately we need him. We need his eternal perspective. We need him to take us higher. And it's all for the asking. I have a friend who is a beautiful, wonderful Christian lady. She loves the Lord dearly. She loves her family dearly. She serves God well. She serves her family well. She works so very, very hard. Ah, She's a very special person. And she has a rather special gift. She has this ability to attract calamity in her life. She has been bitten by bugs and animals. She has found herself in some of the strangest, uh, most unbelievable circumstances and situations. Uh, And it just seems to happen on a regular basis for her. What she often does is to snap pictures of the, the situation that she's in and post it on social media, always asking for advice and saying, what would you do? But also, and I love this about her, always just kind of laughing at herself in and through it all, not taking herself too seriously in the midst of all of it, but recognizing that, yes, life happens and we just have to deal with it. But here's the most important thing to me, is with each and every one of these communications on social media, with the, with the pictures that sometimes are, are, are silly and laughable and at other times just hurt your heart to think, oh no, I'm so sorry you're experiencing this. With each and every one of those social media posts, she always acknowledges that God is at work in this, through this, somehow, some way, and she is confident and faithful that God is working his will in and through her and is strengthening and making her a better person and a better wife and mother, a better follower of Christ in and through it all. I love that about her. 
I hope you're watching this morning and I know you know who you are and I want you to know you motivate me so much as you cry out to God and just give him, give him yourself and say, take me higher, God, let me see your perspective. And I know you're motivating others today as I share the story. Thank you. And so, friends, just let me ask you this morning, are you ready to go to that higher place with God? Are you tired? Have you tr are you done? Are you just done trying every alternative that you can think of to try to remedy the very situation that you are in in life right now? Are you just a little fed up with the free advice that other people are just so anxious to give you when they know so very little, understand virtually nothing of what you're experiencing? Are you at the end of yourself yet? Johnny, are you at the end of yourself yet? Because when we get there, as hard as it may seem, and as difficult and even painful as it may feel, that's such a beautiful place for us to cry out from the end of ourselves to God and say, oh God, take me higher. Take me to that rock, you, the rock, that is oh so much higher than I am. I long for your refuge and the shelter in your wings, Lord God. Thank you. Thank you that I know that you will take me higher. It's just mine for the asking. Won't you pray with me, friends? Gracious God, I thank you for each person that is listening in and worshiping you today in this setting and situation or or any other that they might find themselves in today. I pray, God, that in the course of this holiday weekend, Lord, that you would be with folks and that you would help them, Father, to take the time, to make the time, to be alone with you, and just, Lord, to, to share from the very depths of their spirits, what's going on in their lives, and to plead with you, Lord God, to help them to see your perspective, your eternal perspective. Help us all, God, myself included, to better understand what it is that you are doing in us, who it is that you are making us to be, how it is that you are molding and shaping us to better serve you and to live for you and to minister on your behalf and to share you with others and how, Lord God, that whatever the difficulty is that we are experiencing, that it becomes the strength of our story to share with others who are behind us on that same road that needs you. Lord, use us, I pray. Father God, I pray that you would be with families this weekend in particular who have lost loved ones in serving our country to protect the very freedoms that we enjoy today. Lord, touch their hearts, comfort their grief, wrap your loving arms tightly around them. Let them feel that very peace that comes only in the very shelter of your wings. Father, we love you. We thank you for all the opportunities that you give us to serve and love one another and to serve and to love and to praise and worship and adore you. Lord God, may your name be proclaimed in this place and beyond. And we thank you for the amazing and wonderful, loving, all-knowing, all-powerful God that you are. And Lord God, we give you ourselves and pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.
forth in my heart to break me apart. I need you to open my eyes to see that you're shaping my life. All I am, I surrender. Give me faith to trust what you say. That's your. Never will. 